Well, we're going to go to Romans chapter 3 again, and we've got our, our thing here that I... And I want to say something too. If you didn't look at this book, I want to recommend it to you again. One God, one message. Paul Ransom, Ransom I mean, Paul Ransom spent years as a missionary in Senegal, West Africa. That's where Dwight and Pam Gefeller spent. He talks about the Wolof tribe in here and ministering to them. That's where Dwight and Pam ministered, our own missionaries that were there for a number of years. French speaking, Arab, Arabic though, and Muslim dominated. That's what it is, Senegal. And uh, he's got some wonderful illustrations. And you know that I love to give a meaning of a word and then illustrate it and then apply it. That's the pattern I use in teaching and preaching. He's excellent with his illustrations of how he does that with Muslims, okay? Muslims. And so we're here with the, the religion of Islam. And Muslim means to be submitted or obedient. It's like a servant. Remember that this man, his original name was not Muhammad, all right? It was changed, but it means praiseworthy is what it means. Uh, but Islam has to do with submission or being a servant. And this young man, Muhammad, the founder of the Islam religion, developed a religion that was parallel to his experience. That oftentimes happens when man-made religions come. It comes out of people's experiences. And he was orphaned as a young boy became a shepherd's servant, and then a camel driver as a servant and a slave to a woman that he eventually married that was 15 years older than him, and then he became a merchant. And then he got wealthy, so he went into meditation, and it was during meditation, at a certain point in his life, he had meditated for a number of years, and then he began to experience what we would call a fit. He would, he would begin to... to to foam at the mouth, apparently, and he would see things that were supposed to be revelations of the true religion that he was supposed to get Mecca out of and the Arab, uh, Arab uh, territory, Arabia. He would thought they were too superstitious and crazy, and so, but really we would say today that that's a demonic experience he was getting going into these so-called states where he would not act normal and he would get all these revelations. But his background, and I want to just give you one thought about this when you speak to them. They view God as a powerful sovereign, Allah. They view themselves, their whole duty as individuals is submission or obedience like a servant. The difference between what we have and they have is we don't view ourselves just as abject servants to God. We are servants of the Lord, but how do we view ourselves? Exactly. We're sons, not servants. We're children of God. We have a relationship with a personal father and an elder brother, Jesus Christ, and a personal Holy Spirit that lives closer than breathing and, and hands and feet are to us, as the songwriter says. So that is a difference to emphasize to them. They're in a legalistic, submissive, you've got to obey like a servant, the commands of your mighty master, Allah. Okay? If you don't obey him, at the end of life you're going to be resurrected one day and on the scales, or after you die, there's a scale. And if your good works outweigh your bad works, that's where that originally comes from. Outweigh your bad works, then you'll, get, you'll make it. Now sometimes it's close and Allah is merciful and he arbitrarily get, goes against his own law of the balance and will let you in. And that's one of the things you've got to realize about their God. He has laws that he himself breaks. 
That's something you want to pick up on. And he brings that out so aptly in this book. And I'm going to try and give you some quotes out of it. But it's the, it's a, in the polytheistic culture of Mecca and Arabia, Muhammad chose Allah. And Allah means the God. Okay? An exclusive statement. We also believe our God is exclusive. There's a trinity of three, and that's exclusive. And Larry and I were in Dr. Newtz's class this morning, and Elohim is the Hebrew word for God, and that letter M for English name is a indicator of more than two, not just a plural. I am, we were taught in Hebrew, indicated plural, but when you have that M on it, it means not single or double, but triple or more. And so right at the beginning, in the beginning God created the heavens and earth. Let us make man in our own image. And that's God, Elohim, three, speaking and saying we're going to create man and we're going to create the, all of these things. Okay? So, but they say there's not a trinity. They say Jesus did get uh, born of a virgin, but he was not divine. And once again, we talked about no Holy Spirit. You're going to have to live the Islam faith by your own strength. No empowerment of the Holy Spirit. Get that. Can you imagine if you were assigned by God? Okay, now start living right. And do it in your own strength. We're already failures, and we would just simply break another command if he told us to do that, right? If it was in our own strength. Thank God for the Holy Spirit dwelling in us. As a former camel driver who married a rich widow for whom he was working, he developed a religion that was monotheistic, exclusive. The God is what Allah means, aggressive against others of differing religions. He literally, after he formed this religion, he had to flee Mecca, go to what is present day Medina. That's not what it was named at that time. And he got everything crystallized and then he developed armies to go back and he finally conquered Mecca that had driven him out with this new religion he brought in. So right from the beginning, he's using force. Today, the Muslims are going to use force to get you to convert if you won't submit to their Allah, all right? Now, Brother Paul, he, you ran into some of this in Africa, I assume. Well, in, in Cameroon, Cameroon. Uh, before our kids were evacuated, uh, an imam and his helper went on two occasions to try to convert him. We were thankful that they were evacuated shortly after because that could have been uh, the end of their okay. lives. Yeah, because that's what happened to this lady that is with Doug Carriger's Wounded Spirits Ministry. There, she came back being in a fundamental Baptist missionary family, and she and one of her sons went out with her husband at this time, 219, in northern Cameroon, and the Muslims came and killed her husband in front of her and her son. And she went through this tra trauma and Doug Carriger got involved in getting her out of the trauma of a wounded spirit, as we say, okay? Uh, that's exactly what happened. And now she does blogs. Pastor Croc and I have had the opportunity to do some of these blogs that are over in Ukraine being interpreted and people are coming to the Lord in it. It's just a privilege to be a part of those blogs. and. Uh, but this woman is on those blocks and she shares her story. She has, once again, a traumatic trial has now turned into triumph and she's helping lots of women that have been abused in America. She has a ministry. That's her ministry now. She, her trouble turned into a triumph. Well, we better keep going. Muhammad also led his followers to reject not only the Jews as a people, but even to rob people of other countries in their caravan. Stealing is forbidden in Islam, but they didn't practice it, okay? <laughs> Although Muhammad's religion, 
Islam was exclusive. His followers believe in five pillars that allowed for Jesus and some of the New Testament uh, apostles to be valid prophets. At one time it was considered to be 28. But Muhammad is the greatest of these prophets, the latest and the greatest. That's really what he's termed as. Resuscitation are more authoritative in the Quran than any other scriptures. What they say in their five doctrines of Islam, Allah is the only true God, that repetition that they have is in the first couple of chapters of the Quran. That's what they're repeating. You can, you can find out what they, if you have a copy of the Quran or you can come and look at it. Well, they, although Muslims accept Old Testament writings, the New Testament writings are likely to be rejected when Christ is preached as the Savior of the world. Now, if you go down to their five pillars on point two, reciting Islam's creeds, that's what's in these first two chapters, okay? They're, they're very repetitive. The practice of prayer five times a day toward Mecca. He was the one that changed from people in his area in Arabia praying toward Jerusalem, where the temple was, to now Mecca. He changed that. But almsgiving, that's giving to the poor, a month of fasting, Ramadan, we see that over here. They eat all night and then they go without food during the day. I don't sleep well when I eat too much at night. How about you? <laughs> we don't eat too late, so forth. Hey, wasn't that a classic this morning? What subject did you teach <laughs> that old bald headed did? <laughs> I told, turned to my wife, I said, he, he, something's gonna get back to her. <laughs> She's gonna say, He's, that's the experience when you go to a 50th class reunion or a 60th, <laughs> all right? But coming back, Allah is the only true God under the five doctrines. Allah has sent many prophets up to 100,000. I think the latest count was like 120,000 are now recognized by them. They have four inspired books, the Quran, the Pentateuch of Moses, the first five books of the Bibles, uh, Bible, and then the Psalms of the Bible and the Evangel of Jesus, they call it Injil of Jesus. So where he's speaking the, the teachings of Jesus, they would accept that, but not if you make him the Messiah and Savior, all right? They have many angels, good and bad, and they get involved in using them as intermediators to Allah. Demons and what we would call good angels. A day of judgment according to man's deeds weighed in a balance. There's that balance truth. That's their fifth pillar. Then the five, uh, I mean their uh, fifth uh, doctrine, that, that balance deal. The five pillars, reciting of the Islam creed, first and second surah is mainly what they're doing. The practice of prayer five times a day toward Mecca. You get it in these foreign countries and you're woken or awakened by the minaret call to prayer, all right? Uh, they even have Hindus do this too, and you'll be in a Hindu setting in Manipur, and you'll be awakened in the morning at five in the morning, and here's a Hindu call to prayer, similar, very much like the Muslims. Uh, the almsgiving, a month of fasting, the pilgrimage to Mecca, things to remember. Surah 2, that's right at the beginning of this, and a surah means chapter, all right? And they have 120 some of them in this, I, as I recall, uh, of the, the surahs. They, I, I don't remember exactly how many there are, but they have a number of chapters in it, and then uh, nine promote holy war. The heathen, or what they would call the um, pagans, uh, Infidels. 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 I finally got it. <laughs> On the third try, the, uh, they, you, you actually, if they don't convert, then you're to put the sword to them. And that's stated in their Quran. Okay? And people, whenever we had 9-11, people were claiming over here politically, oh, the Muslims are peaceful. Well, maybe the majority of them are in America. But those that follow the Quran, what we would call fundamentalist 
that are literalist. They interpret it as it's stated. They are to kill. And you get promoted to better heaven conditions and reward for killing Jews and Christians, the infidels. They use the term the people of the book and the people of the sun is really what it is. Okay. Allah's power is emphasized to the exclusion of other attributes. This is a legalistic religion, therefore an approach offers a relationship to forgiving God needs to be emphasized. You're talking about a personal God, not just a powerful God when you witness to them. And that's what Romans 3 is all about. Romans 3 is saying, okay, we've got bad deeds, no one has kept the law, though they say you're supposed to keep Allah's laws, you can't do it, and they know they can't do it. Well, the law was given not for us to be saved by it, but to show us our sin. And that's what we're going to look at here in Romans 3. Let's go back to that passage last week. This is, this is the best passage I know that covers their doctrine to clarify. Verse 19, Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them that are under the law that every mouth may be stopped, not to go to heaven, and all the world become guilty or condemned before God. This means under God's righteousness or subpar righteousness, guilty. Therefore, by the deeds or the works of the law, there shall no flesh be justified. Justified means to be declared righteous. Declared righteous legally before God in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. God gave the law to show how holy and righteous he is and how unholy and unrighteous we are. Okay? The law reveals our wretched heart, dead in trespasses and sin. So we see, but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested being witnessed by the law and the prophets. The Old Testament law and the Old Testament prophets pointed to this righteousness. They were pointing to Christ coming, okay? Even the righteousness of God, which is not by submission or obedience, but by faith, depending upon Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe, for there's no difference. Jew and Gentiles, Muslims, we're all... We're all guilty sinners falling short of God's glory. That's falling short of His perfect sinlessness or His righteousness. No matter how we try, we always fall short. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely, not something we deserve or pay for. Now I want to read one of the things that Brother Ransom, Ransom says in this book. He says, uh, concerning this very thing of our not keeping the law, he says, mercy without justice. That's what it's called. He got an email from a Muslim. He's ministering years ago, of course, in Senegal. He's living in Greenville now. He said in this Muslim to him, that is, Paul Bramson said, you say Allah cannot forgive arbitrarily. You say that Allah's hands are tied by his own laws. You wrote, God can do everything except deny himself and ignore his laws. Why would our most merciful creator, referring to Allah, prevent himself from having the capacity to forgive his servants who ask for forgiveness? Servants, not sons. Servants that ask for forgiveness. All you got to do is ask for forgiveness. And even though you don't deserve it, there's no means for you to deserve it, he will arbitrarily, even though your bad works outweigh your good works, he will arbitrarily sometimes forgive you. Why would he place such a constraint on his mercy? Can you not see this makes no sense? Even if he were to make such a law, he could break it immediately as he is all-powerful. Get that statement? Allah could break his own law even as he is all-powerful. That's quite a statement, folks. That's the key 
to their, uh, us understanding their Allah. It is illogical to argue that Allah with ultimate power is limited in any way. In other words, he can break his own laws. He, if he wishes, he could hurl us all into the fire of hell, but he is the most merciful one and is always looking to forgive his servants so they can succeed when they are judged. May Allah grant us all his forgiveness and have mercy on us on the day when we all to gather together and must stand to be judged alone. So what he's saying, he's all powerful, he's a merciful God, but you know what that does? What does that do to God? If he will just arbitrarily break his own law to give you mercy and forgive you, what's the problem with that? Think with me a moment. Pardon? What, what, what does that make God? He's not, not a God. No, not a God. He's not a just God. Yeah, I, I, I remember He's not the just God we know. I remember uh, someone said something about it, and or, what I heard him was that God could, that, you know, that Allah could change his mind, and, and you could yeah. all kinds of laws as long as it justifies what you're doing, then you yeah. can go back the other way. That's okay. Okay, you, what he's saying, Allah will come and justify you and declare you not guilty. Okay, for what you are guilty. Now one of the things that we need to remember, what is mercy? It is God giving us what we don't deserve. Okay, it's not him giving us what we deserve. Mercy is God not giving us what we deserve. But what is justice? It is God giving us what we deserve, okay? Now, if you take and say, God, okay, no longer you're going to be just. You're not going to give us what we're going to deserve. You're just going to arbitrarily say, I forgive you. God is showing mercy, but there's no balance of justice. And he's not a balanced God. It's like a bird with one wing. I saw a bird uh, hopping along the, and I started going up to it this week. Uh, out on our backyard, and I thought that bird's not afraid of me. And then I got to realize, hey, it's got a messed up wing. One wing maybe could work, but the other one won't work. I don't know if one of our cats tore up the wing or what happened, but I tell you that bird's not going to fly. Why? Because it's only got one wing. That's what's happening here with God. If you only give him a wing of mercy, but there's no wing of justice. He's not balanced and he's not going to fly and he's not going to be the Bible God. He's not going to fly as the Bible God and I'm not being irreverent. You understand what I'm saying? So you got to do that. Well, how does God do that? Then if he gets his people that are creatures, not his ch children yet, and he wants to forgive them, this is what Romans 3 says. Romans 3 comes here in these next verses being justified, verse 24, being justified freely, okay, it doesn't cost humans anything. They are not going to get what they deserve. What they're going to get is not what they deserve, either good or bad, okay? That's mercy by His grace, though. Grace has to do with me getting something free, but somebody else deserved it. Who deserved it? Grace. We got to remember, Jesus deserved eternal life for us and forgiveness. So somebody deserved it, we didn't. <clears throat> and so he goes on by grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. The redemption, the payment of a price to purchase someone. What is that price? Well, it comes down to verse 25 whom God has set forth to be a propitiation. And what is propitiation? This is simply the sacrifice that satisfies the holiness of God's wrath. Okay? Satisfy. It says in Isaiah 53, you shall see the travail of his soul and he shall be what? Satisfied. The payment has been made. What has been deserved has been paid. I punished my own son. So through faith in his blood, the payment was blood, his life. 
He had to give his life. He had to be separated from God the Father. Instead of us being separated from God for all eternity, he is crying out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness. Whose righteousness? God's righteousness for the remissions of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. To declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, God's righteousness, it's a gift that he might be what? Look at that statement, that next statement. That he might be what? Just and the justifier. You got it there. He can only justify someone if he is just. Okay? And the payment has been paid and Jesus did it. And so he's the just and justifier of him, anyone who believes in Jesus. That's why this is so good for them. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you one more quote out of this. And we'll try and, and conclude some of this here. Because at the bottom I give you three things to emphasize to Muslims. When witnessing to them, God's nature is balanced. The Muslims, Allah is powerful but lacking any sufficient holiness, love, or true mercy. Okay? Okay, true mercy or just mercy. What we would say, just mercy. You can add that in there. Just mercy. God is the powerful one who created. Yes, God is the personal one who commanded as a holy God. God is a loving God who provides for man's failure. And here's a point. The love of our powerful God. They just don't have it. They have an arbitrary, unjust, so-called merciful God. But they don't have a loving God that takes care of our penalty of our sin. God was willing to suffer, suffer as a loving God. And if we're going to be like him, we're going to suffer. We're going to be willing to suffer. Why? So we can grin and bear it and say, look at how holy I am. I'm suffering. Yes, I'm a wonderful person. No, for others. And you know the application of this in First Peter that Pastor Crockett is going to get to eventually. It's applied to marriage relationship. That's why 1 Peter 3, 1 and 7 say likewise. And what's likewise to whom? Wives, submit to your own husbands. You're going to suffer doing that. Okay? It's not a Sunday school picnic, is it? Ladies, it's not a Sunday school picnic, right? It's not easy. It's not a happy time always, is it? Okay? But if you're being like God for the benefit of a disobedient husband, that is joy because you're being like God, suffering for the benefit of someone else. Husbands, it says, likewise ye husbands, dwell with your wives according to knowledge, giving honor unto her as the weaker vessel, being heirs together. Is it always easy to understand your wife, men? <laughs> it's easy, isn't it? I, I just naturally know how she's operating and thinking and feeling. And, and no, you don't. You've got to learn it, and then you've got to live with her accordingly. But, and when you do that for her, then she's going to learn you, too. She's going to want to learn you. Women don't understand men, but we've got to take the lead on that. Okay, so it's likewise. Is it going to be some suffering for a man to do that? You better believe it. Okay? Can I, I want to conclude. We've got to conclude here with it. Okay? Here's an illustration that I think you want to remember. I gave you the one where I posed the court trial of a murderer of another Muslim friend there at Greenville Tech. You remember? And, the, and they go before the judge and the judge just says, well, you want forgiveness today, I'll, I'll just let you go. And he's already killed people in another state and he just killed your Muslim buddy friend and you're wanting justice. You want this person to be punished, get what they deserve and the judge just lets them go. You remember me sharing that. Well, here's one about how I'd explain to them the fallen nature of man. One day he says, I was chatting with some men in Senegal at a tree near a mosque. 
The conversation turned to the subject of sin and death. I broke a branch off of the tree and asked them, is this branch dead or alive? Now, what would your response be? A branch has been twisted off of a tree and you're asked, is this branch dead or alive? He says, one of the men answered, it's dying. Another said, it's dead. I chided him, how can you say it's dead? Look how green it is, it has leaves on it. it. But he came back, it looks alive, but it's dead because it's separated from its source of life, he answered. Oh, good answer. Separated from his source of life. He said, that's the condition of man, dead in trespasses and sin. Separation, that's the one term that defines death. And he goes on, he says, Exactly, I replied, you have just given an accurate definition of death according to the scriptures. Death is not annihilation, but separation from the source of life, capital letters of S and life, God. That is why when a loved one dies, even before the body is buried, we say, he's gone. We say that because we know the person's spirit has left his body, that's physical death. And he gives a great, that's a great illustration. So if ever I get around a Muslim, I'm going to look for a tree, all right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> to get them to understand. We've got to use illustrations, folks, when we witness. We're going we're gonna to conclude here today. But uh, Brother Tim, I'm going to have you close in prayer. But Tim's got Hindus in his area he lives. And we just went through Hinduism. Ask God to bring a Muslim near you. Right over here on Hudson Road, some years ago, we went and visited one of the mosque leaders of Greenville here on Hudson Road. Okay? They're around. Check it out on the uh, Google and ask them how many Arabs are in Greenville. I remember us going through a list of Arab names in the phone book because we were going to reach out to the Arabs and try and find Muslims that needed the Lord. Tim, would you close us in prayer, brother? Dear Father, thank you so much for dying on that cross, mm. removing our sins, and guaranteeing our salvation through your resurrection. Mm. Thank you so much for your love and the eternal life you've given us. Help us be a witness for you where we live and where we work. And I just pray that you would give us the words and the opportunities to witness for you. Lord, you know all the prayer requests. And we know that you're working throughout the world for good and for your second coming. Mm -hmm. And we look forward to that and pray that you might mm -hmm. come soon. We'll give you the praise and the glory. Be with each one in this room. Carry them through this week. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.